All right, while we're switching out presentations, we who do not have operational AI minute takers yet are going to switch out our minute takers. So I'd like to thank Riley and introduce Amber Jackson, who is a scientific program analyst in the Tide office and will be taking over for the rest of the afternoon. Okay, and Lyric is here, so I'm delighted to introduce and welcome to our advisory council, Lyric Jorgensen, who is um, the Associate Director for Science Policy at NIH and the Director of the NIH Office of Science Policy. Uh, Lyric is internationally recognized expert in science policy and a key member of the NIH senior leadership team and the principal policy advisor to the NIH director. Uh, Lyric specializes in conceptualizing and developing policies and initiatives that drive vital biomedical research forward in a responsible manner. She's especially dedicated to ensuring that all voices have the opportunity to meaningfully engage in policy development and implementation, and has a philosophy that evidence-based policy must be responsive to the needs of both the scientific community, but also the public, which funds the NIH through its tax dollars. Uh, prior to her appointment as the NIH Associate Director for Science Policy, Lyric had numerous senior leadership roles across the U.S. government, including the role as the Deputy Executive Director of the Cancer Moonshot. Uh, by way of background, uh, she's a Midwest native, having earned a bachelor's degree in psychology from Denison University in Ohio and a PhD from the graduate, in, in, from the graduate program from neuroscience at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. I actually started working closely with Lyric. I knew her, but then I particularly started working with her in, I think it's about 2015, when she served as the executive secretary of a working group of the advisory committee to the NIH director that established a, what was then a new vision. Uh, but then a new vision for the National Library of Medicine, um, and, I, uh, and uh, that was prior to the recruitment of the previous NLM director. I was actually the co-chair of that working group, and, and without Lyric, that would not have gone well, that working group. She was a delight to work with. But since then, we've even worked more closely when um, she and I served as co-chairs of one of the four data councils that Sean Mooney was just talking about. She and I were the co-chairs of the NIH Data Science Policy Council for several years. She continues to be the co-chair. Um, I've now stepped down as a co-chair and just a member of that group. But she's been a good friend of mine, a good friend of NHGRI's. Lots of people at the Institute know Lyric and always speak very fondly of her. And we're delighted that she could join us here today to update council on the NIH policy landscape, something I think she would admit has, is never associated with a dull moment. <laughs> So. Thank you so much, Eric. That was a lovely introduction, and I'm really glad to be here with you all in person today. It has been a really long time since I've done a council meeting in person, so it's very exciting to be here. Um, as mentioned, my name is Lyric Jorgensen, and I'm the policy director here at NIH, and I'm looking forward to tell you about some of the administration priorities, just a few, because as Eric mentioned, there are a lot, um, and, but the ones that are particularly relevant to NHGRI and those who are around the table and watching on the audience today. So just quickly, for those of you who are not familiar with the Office of Science Policy, we sit in the office of the director at NIH, but we work closely with all of the institutes and centers and many of the policy offices in the institutes, such as NHGRIs. Um, we really think about how to work across the biomedical research enterprise to get policy to evolve with science and in support with science. So not reactive and not stifling science, but really in tandem. So we spend a lot of time thinking about biosecurity, data, data science, data sharing, open access access, clinical research, human subjects protection, and more. So today I'm going to talk to you about four priorities of the administration, again, just a few, um, that really have some relevance to the portfolio here today. Um, first is going to be around protecting American sensitive data, which we're really talking about personal data, genomes, electronic health records, and more. Promoting safe and secure AI research, so I was delighted to hear Sean Mooney talk right before me because he's really a leader in this space. Um, access to taxpayer-funded research results, and that word research results is going to be used really broadly. And then public engagement to inform clinical research, which is something our office is really passionate about. So let's start with protecting American sensitive data. For those of you who are not aware, the administration has been really eager to think about how to stop countries of concern from exploiting Americans' data, whether it be for uses of blackmail, espionage, and more. In February 28th, there was an executive order issued by the president's office that explicitly prohibits sharing data with foreign adversaries. And there are seven countries of concern listed for foreign adversaries and anyone tied to those countries. And prohibited data sets that they're looking at um, explicitly prohibiting are human genomic data, biometric identifiers, personal health data, 
precise geolocation data, and personal financial data to with covered personal identifiers. So importantly, an executive order sets out a policy direction for the US government, but is not the final policy. Final policy goes through rulemaking process. So an advance notice of proposed rulemaking was put out March 5th. And this is where they really talked about what are bulk data, what types of data, what types of genomic data might be involved. And so this is something really important for our community to weigh in on because they're looking to you to understand what type of information is really at what level sensitive. Is that 1,000 genomes? Is that a million genomes? Is that one genome? Really, what are we looking for to be able to really inform? A new proposed rule, the final step before a final regulation should be coming out before this administration um, transitions. So be on the lookout for this information because from this, we will then set HHS policies about how these types of data get transferred be between countries of concern. Next, I want to talk about how we're thinking about this at NIH. Again, we're talking about administration priorities and what NIH is doing in terms of the policy space that really allows the science to proceed, but in a way that matches these policy priorities. So recently, you might have seen that there was a new um, guide notice around security expectations for genomic data sharing. I'm certain everyone here is familiar with the genomic data sharing policy that NIH has long promulgated. So the number of controlled access data repositories that really share genomic data under the genomic data sharing policy have steadily grown over the years. I'm sure you're all very aware of that and have benefited from it. The number of users have also increased. We now have approximately 20 NIH support control, supported controlled access repositories sharing genomic data, and we're seeing strong growth in the number of access requests received. So we need to make sure we're keeping pace with the scale of developments and the security risks. So in this implementation guide notice, you see two important updates for the community. One, updating our security standards. Again, this is all the information you heard Sean Mooney talking about. Making sure all of the repositories are operated under the expected security to keep it from being hacked, data being breached, and making sure that we have appropriate review protocols. Also importantly, it establishes the minimum standards and for um, transparency and oversight for developers who are accessing NIH repositories. This is where AI also is really starting to transform the landscape is we're not only using data for research, but we're using data to test our algorithms and be able to figure out whether or not we can develop new algorithms that are then shared. So we need to make sure that those developers who are using our data are being held to the same standards as any researcher would be. Importantly, this is not a new policy. It's just an implementation update on the way we're managing this policy. We expect the guide notice will apply to about 20 controlled access repositories, their approved users, and any developers, and it will take effect on January 25th, 2025. Next, I'm going to turn to more around AI research. It is definitely an administration priority in every wing of the administration we're talking about AI, whether it is to promote health, whether it's to advance science, or whether or not we, there are some security risks. So you may have seen, again, as an administration priority, the president put out an executive order in October promoting the safe, secure, and trustworthy development and use of artificial intelligence. Importantly for us, this is a whole USG-wide approach, but there are many opportunities for HHS to guide and align policy around AI. So as President Biden said, it's really to help solve urgent challenges while making our world more prosperous, productive, innovative, and secure and protecting us against irresponsible use that could exacerbate societal harms. So again, advancing the good stuff and protecting us from risk, privacy, civil um, liabilities, and, and social rights. So where that translates for NIH actions is thinking about a framework for nucleic acid synthesis screening. This has been a priority for some time now in terms of thinking about how do we have synthetic nucleic acid providers actually thinking about the dual use concerns of the sequences. Do we have a database of sequences of concerns? Do we know what to look for? People are ordering these um, um, in certain quantities or in certain components. So what the White House has done, it convened an interagency group to think about what would be the criteria for a provider to think through. So provider adherence criteria would be thinking about um, customer legitimacy, any of the sequences of concerns identified, and more. 
What we're working to is to keep this as a minimum burden for our researchers. So thinking about how the providers can work with the government to attest their adhering to this framework so that the, seek, the communities know who the good actors are and can go to them easily and keep, um, keep their sequences flowing. This is still all under development. The framework for nucleic acid synthesis screening is out and it is public. HHS is currently working to figure out how to put this into its grants and contracts and other transaction authorities, again, to create minimal burden for the researchers, because what we're really looking for is this, the providers of the sequences to be vigilant and paying attention. And then finally, before I leave that conversation around AI, I did want to let you all know that AI, like any other rapidly advancing technology, is the mainstay of what NIH does here, right? Advanced discoveries, incorporate new technologies, and pioneer game-changing technologies. So we're really ready to incorporate AI into our, advanced, our responsive policy framework. So most recently, we released a new website that really integrates all of the relevant AI policies that we are aware of to date. So it can be a one-stop shop for people to understand how we think about research participant protections through the lens of AI. Or what are the frequently asked questions about sharing code and, and data for data management and sharing practices. And again, thinking about some of these biosecurity concerns. And of course, how do we manage intellectual property as algorithms are coming on the stage? Next, I'm going to move into the third priority, which is around access to taxpayer-funded research. And again, I'm using taxpayer-funded research results broadly here. So let's start at the front end of the pipeline and share with you which, um, a figure which I think many of you probably have seen to date. Um, this is here is a graph from the, um, the timeline of which the pathogen for SARS-CoV-2 was identified all the way into the first time it was injected in our former boss's um, arm. Again, a historic feat, a COVID vaccine in under a year, and it's really built on the shoulders of all the work that you all have done over decades to be able to make this such a fast advance. Part of the key to this success was really open science. During the pandemic, we saw over 2.5 million SARS-CoV-2 genomic sequences shared, 1,300 SARS-CoV-2 protein structures shared, more than 300 reagents um, for biomedical research, 7.38 uh, billion rows of clinical data, and 500,000 papers. And this is an old figure. I believe it's probably still from 2022. So I'm sure that this number has grown since that time. So increasing access to the publications and data from federally funded research really is what's driving some of these scientific community um, advances and really providing benefit to the public. Also importantly, sharing this information, we've shown from many surveys um, from the public, increases trust in biomedical research and the ability to actually um, feel confident in what we are delivering. So the, right now is something that we're thinking about again, what are those lessons learned from the pandemic and how can we um, continue to advance this kind of um, uh, priority? So along these lines, the president released a directive um, ensuring free and immediate access to research results. So several US government policy initiatives are underway, thinking about increasing meaningful and equitable access. Again, you heard Sean talking about it's not enough to just th show, throw data out into the environment, but it has to have the standards so that it can be reused, understood through the metadata and more. So first step was access to federally funded research data through the genomic data sharing policy, which is already in effect. Um, it's already completed its first round, so this is really where NIH has paved the way. Um, the White House has also directed access to federally funded research publications needs to be increased. So most recently, you've heard about a zero embargo period for publications. We previously had a one-year embargo period. Now we're moving to zero, and um, NIH has released its plan of how we're going to get there. Again, thinking about the quality and access and equitability, so thinking about PubMed again so that we're not driving those costs into the investigator's hands or into junior investigators who might not be able to cover the costs. So those are all some of the policy considerations we're thinking about um, in, in public access policy. Again, this isn't going to be too unfamiliar to NIH folks. Um, this agency has been a leader here for some time. Obviously, the public access policy we currently have was in 2008. And again, as I mentioned, the data management sharing policy has been underway now for several years. And collectively, 
We're collecting the data now to be able to actually um, see how it catalyzes research advances. Is it actually improving access to health knowledge and interventions? And really, how does it build trustworthiness in science? So hopefully, when Eric invites me back in a few years, we'll be able to show the analysis of what we actually got for these policy investments. I'm then gonna jump ahead to a different type of product or, or a federally funded research result that really has caught the administration's attention with good reason, and this is around affordable access to medicines. You probably heard a lot in the news about the rising costs or the very high costs of prescription drugs, and many would say, what does NIH have to do with this as a, as a knowledge-based agency? Um, there's a lot of analysis suggesting almost every product on the market has some sort of tie to federal funds. Um, and of course, that's because we are really the largest biomedical research funder in the world. So our inventions are really driving um, the, the uh, intellectual property behind a lot of the, the products on the market today. So um, President Biden, and I suspect um, any administration change, regardless of which party, will continue to care of how do we think about drug pricing from an executive branch perspective. NIH's job is to fund research. We don't set drug prices. So we've been trying to figure out what is NIH's role in this broader picture, given that we don't set drug prices. So one, we've been part of an interagency working group thinking about the Marchin framework. Um, it's a little complicated, but a bottom line is by Dole transfers property rights to the institutions that make the discoveries so that those can work with the local community to get it into companies, startups, and more. Um, and that's a, a super important law and that we're really, um, really committed to. But there are times of exceptional circumstances which the government might need to take ownership. Depending on what where you are in the government, some believe that that should be pricing. Some people don't believe it should be pricing. The question is, what is the tight right price? We are coming together as a government to really put that criteria on paper so we all know what we're talking about. Because if we're all arguing in the government and are aware of this law, nobody else can understand what we're talking about. So step one is to put all the criteria for how we would use March and Framework before we even talk about executing against it. So this draft March and Framework was put out for public comment. Not surprisingly, we got lots of input from it, from institutions to companies to patient groups and more. And we are working through those comments now to put out a final framework so that we can really interpret this statute consistently across the government. Because again, by Dole isn't just an HHS rule, it's also Department of Energy, Department of Defense and more, and so we all wanna be in lockstep. On the other side of the spectrum, and I just thinking about what can we specifically do here at this agency to impact access for patients. So I wanted to talk about one of the, in, the policy initiatives we just recently launched. It's still a draft policy, and it's a draft policy for the intramural research program. So again, the scientists on the NIH campus, not the extramural world. So what we're doing here is proposing to develop and implement a policy, again, with the intramural program to promote access to products stemming from NIH inventions. So what do I mean here? Anytime someone in the intramural program develops an invention that a potential licensee wants to have access to, whether it's biologic, drug, or some other product, they will submit an access plan to the agency saying how they will think about promoting access. We have defined access broadly. We could be talking about pricing. We could talk about geographic diversity. We could talk about whether or not it's in product development. Should it be two doses of a vaccine versus three doses of a vaccine, because that could affect access. How are developers thinking about access broadly when they're using federally funded inventions? So that is the policy that we put out for common. Again, you're getting a theme. We ask for common on everything we do here so that we get the right parameters around it um, and are currently working through those comments to really think about what a model agreement would look like again, for licensees working with an NIH intramural program. So we're hoping um, to release that policy in the next few months, provided all the comments direct us in the right way. So finally, I wanna talk about building trust through engagement. And this is something we have learned, um, as scientists, we probably learned along the way, but really during the COVID pandemic, found out how important it was to bring people along with the science. One of the most remarkable things, to, in my opinion, is that we had the vaccine in under a year and people were hesitant to take it. And I think a lot of that was based on trust in science, trust in scientists, and trust in how we actually approach the, the entirety of the enterprise. 
So this is something our team has been tackling, not only from science, but how do you trust policy? Again, when there's a lot of um, concerns about our policymakers as well. So as part of this, as I mentioned, um, studying, the, studying from our past to inform our future, thinking about how we can build the future, science and technology change quickly. We found that a lot of people thought that scientists weren't telling the truth. That's because evidence was changing, and so was the opinions changing alongside the evidence. That's part of the process. Alongside these, we have ethical and societal norms that continually evolve and how we feel about representation. So we're really thinking about policymakers. How do we engage appropriately to advance the science, build trust as we're doing so, and ultimately improve health is our goal. And what we found really is engaging early, often, and along the way. We don't just come up for air once the product is done and give it to you and say, you're welcome, but say, here's what we want to do. Here's what we're thinking about it. Check in multiple times along the way. So let's talk about how we're doing that here. We are trying to build a toolkit for public engagement. So what does this mean? We're thinking for researchers, a practical set of options for researchers to you, do meaningful engagement that can be tailored to the objections, um, objectives, design, scale of the study. There will not be a one-size-fits-all approach. Not every single funding announcement should have a community engagement panel, right? There's going to be a whole different type of scale depending on what you're doing. So let's pilot the best practices on that scale and give researchers a menu that they can choose from. For science, for science as a whole, bringing more people to the table to participate in science will increase representation and understanding of factors affecting successful study design and completion. Again, we find a lot in clinical trial studies that we enroll all of our, our um, participants, but we lose them along the way. So let's try to get that number to have sustainability so we actually have representative research. Of course, bringing participants along with us allows um, them to have a vision and framework for how they can actually touch the scientific enterprise. I think clinical research is a more visible face for people, but how do they talk to, to normal scientists? How do they interact with NIH? And where do they, where's the front door? And then of course for public is we're really trying to make people understand the value of NIH funded research, funded researchers, and, and support for science in general. So what we are doing here is we have convened um, roughly 25 patient advocacy leaders, bioethicists, clinical researchers, and more to start with developing a vision and a framework for how to include public voices in the design, planning, and dissemination of NIH-funded clinical research. So you see that from soup to nuts, right? From the design, through the planning and conduct, all the way to getting the results out the door bringing them along the way. Again, this is hard in the era of information overload, people always being um, getting information. How do we do that in meaningful steps to increase that value? So this is currently underway. There is a, a draft vision that has been put out by these, these patient groups that has been um, weighed in on. We have a new website with has institute case studies talking about how they've approached engagement. And then we are about to start a roadshow across the country, actually going into communities, working with community advocate leaders, um, uh, YMCAs, and more to have community discussions to talk about how people see research, how they'd like to be approached by researchers, and how they'd like to be engaged moving forward. So we expect this to be going for the next six months, and then we'll have a, a roadmap um, coming out of it on the other side. One thing I wanted to highlight for you all before closing on the administration priorities is one of the values that we've heard from our community engagement is the return of value to people who participate in research. And I know that the return of research results has really been a pioneered um, an endeavor by National Human Genome Research Institute. The return of genomic results in particular has been a long studied field. Many of the pioneers um, here with us today I think all of you are probably aware, genomic research results have different levels of return ability based on how they were collected and where they were collected. It gets even more complicated when it is not a clinically actionable research result. And so that's what we're trying to think about, is how do we learn from the experience of genomics and scale that up to other things like environmental research results or other indicators of health and status. So we have lots of, um, again, informed by the, the Genome Institute who have held many workshops. Vence has been leading a lot of work also with the academies, thinking about different sorts of population indicators um, and trying to move forward with a new research program uh, just launched um, late last year and um, really kicked off with awards this year on July 26th. 
This is in partnership with NHGRI, NIEHS, the All of Us program, and, and my team. And this is really about strategies to responsibly report back environmental health and non-genomic research results. So the key for this work is really um, the applications are required to include a bioethical question, data sharing, participant privacy, potential stigma or bias, and a report back um, of the research results and address at least two of three themes. Strategies around ensuring health equity, strategies around communication approaches, and strategies around data use. Again, what we're trying to do is build a portfolio here to help the community, help researchers understand how to responsibly report back research results to people who want them. That's another question. Who wants their research results? How do we track that and return it in a way that's meaningful to them? So I'm, as I mentioned, we just launched this late last year and just had our first round of awards issued in July. You can see we have investigators from all around the country who will be working on, um, on these efforts and we're looking forward to seeing. You'll uh, see some of these are the role of culture, life stage, and information design to facilitate equity in data report back, um, all the way through the evaluation of the report back strategies for long-term and short-term exposures information in a rural trial populations. So again, trying to get a variety of different projects so that we can have a nice repository of approaches. And then finally, before I take it over to questions, what's next? As I had mentioned, we are in a sprint for an administration change. It doesn't matter who wins the election. We do know we are going to have a new boss coming January 20th and 21st. A, a new boss at the White House. <laughs> a new boss at the White House. A new uh, boss Sarah at the White here. House. Thank you for the clarification. We're not pushing Monica. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Dr. Bertinoli would not not favor that, that comment on mine. Um, she is, our director, though, is a political appointee. She does require Senate confirmation, which she has and um, has had for some time now. During a presidential transition, all political appointees customarily resign, and then it will either be accepted or rejected by the incoming president. As many of you know, Dr. Collins' re um, resignation was rejected multiple times, uh, so it does happen. Um, so in the meantime, NIH will work with HHS to prepare presidential transition information briefing documents across the NIH research priorities. Because of this upcoming transition, all of those priorities I just mentioned to you will be on a sprint to make sure they're wrapped up and their longevity will be um, stabilized for the coming years. So I expect to see movement on all of those um, coming forward. So with that, Eric, I think I hit my 30 minutes and happy to take questions. Questions for Lyric? Lots of important topics we've talked around about around this table. Gail. Uh, hi. Um, so it, community engagement is so important. And you know we really do struggle, honestly, to get the engagement we'd like, and particularly in the planning part of the grant. So because you don't have funds. Um, and so, it, and also you're not sure you're going to get the project. So it is very difficult to engage with, especially underrepresented communities, and say, like, we'd like your help right now for free, and then maybe we'll have support for you later. And are there, is there any ideas to support that aspect of, compute, of community engagement? It's an absolute excellent question. I mean, obviously, what people continue to raise is the ability to have funding to support sustainable engagement. Um, I can tell you my own personal anecdote is I, for, for the policy work we've been doing, again, wanting more input into the policy development process, um, it costs a lot of money to go out into communities and have meaningful conversation and not just talk to people. So, so the, the strategy we have been working on is really trying to understand how to leverage community relationships to bring awareness of, of the work. On the specific projects itself, that's a real, that's a real challenge and a question. Um, and the other challenge you know, we're finding, especially working with tribal populations, there's a flood of priorities that are happening right now. There are issues with clean water and other kind of components where in the spate of, of information, if it's not time sensitive and now, talking about what future might happen with a research project has really been a challenge, and, and rightfully so. So this is something we're also trying to learn about 
if you build if you build a community of understanding and awareness and trust that it's more receptive to when it's more close to the time of the actual project because otherwise you're in a place of helicoptering in and out which we we've heard is the biggest problem and, and frankly it's been my problem is building relationships with communities um, they need to be sustained to have that trust right and that is another level of investment and resource and sensitivity um, that we are we're working through but I don't have any solid answers for you Yeah, wonderful presentation. Um, can you expand on whether the embargo policy from 12 months to zero months of that new policy has been published yet? Because I couldn't find it when I was searching for it. And like, what do you think the implications this has kind of with the journals? Um, I mean, it has you know, in the open access kind of era and so forth. Yeah, thank you for the question. So we have not found it. Uh, published a final policy. We showed our, ha our hands um, in a NIH scientific access plan, and then the draft policy was out just a few months ago, and I think just closed in August. So the draft policy was out. There is no final policy yet. Um, in terms of the, the implications, um, again, we are trying to think about our responsibility isn't to dictate business practices, but we do know that the world operates in, in a capitalistic society. So one of the, the the strengths of this policy, and, and we're thankful for the White House for promulgating it, is that the whole government is tackling it. It's not just, in the past, you had specific programs doing it, so they were able to kind of hold those programs as an outlier, um, whereas now the entirety of the federal government has to adhere. So we're starting to see some of the journals um, um, shift their models because they know this is coming, so that's a, it's a good thing. The second thing is we are not going to require open access. Um, we are not, again, requiring any business model. We are going to propose is, is to keep it so that you deposit your author-approved manuscript in PubMed. So again, that's agnostic of business charges. I had a question related to policy on public health issues. For example, screening uh, adults for common genetic conditions. Is that something your office kind of discusses or plans for, or do you wait the evidence to be generated by, let's say, the NHGRI? All of the hard science lifting comes usually from the institutes. We um, often partner with institutes for areas where we can augment some of the policy or bioethical issues, but the real science intensive work doesn't come from my team. It comes from the offices or sometimes in the NIH Director's Common Fund where they're trying to look for some of these novel um, pilot studies. Anything else for Lear? Judy. Yeah, could I follow up on this point? Um, is there in this policy any consideration? I think a lot about peer review and how time consuming kind of high quality peer review can be. Um, is there any thoughts to being a little bit more directive with journals? Uh, I know there's a lot of journals that just have problems getting reviews to be filled out. So uh, have you, have you I, I know you don't want to get into the business models, but kind of the, the, the challenge of peer review is enormous and getting bigger. Absolutely. I mean, I would say that the, the pressures on the reviewers, whether it be peer reviewers, journal reviewers, uh, the, the, the administrative burden is high in many levels. Um, and so thinking of areas we can streamline that is really key. We are, we are very much in conversations with the journals, thinking about ways we can help um, bolster the whole system. Again, I don't want to talk too much about, about what they're approaching, but it's certainly something that we engage in quite routinely with Elsevier and, and others. Just had one follow-up comment on uh, engagement with the community. Uh, I think the AHRQ funded the PICORI grants, and they had a very mm -hmm. strong emphasis on citizen scientists. Yeah. Is there something that you could learn or take away from that? Absolutely. We, we definitely have, um, we have some of the PICORI folks on our actual working group helping us think about the strategies they've employed. Um, so PICORI has done great work, and a lot of the institutes have actually done great work. So one of the things that we wanted to do was bring a community of practice across the institutes. So now every single institute and center has a designated community engagement representative that we all meet once a month so that we can start kind of bolstering the strategies and consistency so that we're speaking with one voice for our community engagement work. Okay. Well, Lyric, thank you so much for coming today. I'm, and I know council benefited from hearing about um, the current landscape, but also appreciating that it's ever-changing. So stay tuned. <laughs>